It's Wednesday, November 25th, and the time for your Barbados Today morning news update. There's been a new development between Club Barbados Resort and Spa and former workers. The company is now again promising to deliver thousands of dollars in severance owed to the more than 150 former employees as soon as this Friday. Our Kareem Smith tells us more. In a letter copied to the Barbados Workers Union, the Chief Labor Officer, the National Insurance Scheme and the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, General Manager Carolyn Gallican hurley informed workers that the West Coast establishment had secured the necessary financing to deliver the outstanding payments immediately. Details of the dramatic about turn were delivered to the hotel workers as they were at Solidarity House filling out severance payments forms from the National Insurance Scheme in hopes of securing their monies from the state-owned Social Security Agency. Former workers whose surnames begin with the letters A through M have been invited to collect their final check on November 27th, while those with the surnames N through Z have been invited to do so on December 2nd. Gallic and Hurley went on to assure the ex-workers that they are sincerely and greatly appreciated for their role in making the club a wonderful and successful hotel prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. The decision follows two days of sheer frustration displayed by the former workers in the form of protests at the Sunset Crescent James property last Wednesday and again at the BWU's Harmony Hall headquarters following a meeting with General Secretary Tony Moore. It's also on the heels of condemnation from the Prime Minister, union leaders and the BHTA over the club's handling of the matter. Kareem Smith for Barbados Today. In other news this Wednesday, more developed countries could engage in protectionism practices when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccination, leaving more vulnerable countries out in the cold. International development economist Dr. Ngozi Onkojo Iwala, who was the special guest of the Sir Winston Scott Memorial Lecture, expressed the concern as she spoke on the topic, international cooperation in the time of COVID. During the virtual forum, she made reference to trade restrictions by several developed countries with respect to personal protective equipment and some food items during the height of the pandemic, and she did not rule out the possibility of countries trying the same tactic with the vaccines. You saw what happened at the beginning of the pandemic. Many countries, I don't know, I think in the Caribbean you must have experienced the same were not able to have access to the medical supplies and equipment, the PPE, the masks, the gloves, all the things that were needed, the ventilators, uh, and this was a problem. Um, so we are also we're hoping that with respect to uh, vaccines, uh, when this become available, because this is also a traded commodity, uh, that we will not have these kinds of restrictions. You know, I say this, let me just say that, look, vaccine nationalism isn't going to work. Because even if you get all your population vac vaccinated, as long as there are others outside who have not been, the, 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 the possibility of, of people in one country getting the disease back is quite high. So um, vaccine nationalism doesn't work in this case. She insisted that international cooperation was absolutely necessary for countries to emerge from the current health pandemic and have a favorable economic growth. And I also believe that until we solve the health aspects of the COVID, we won't be able to tackle the economic uh, aspects uh, appropriately. And um, uh, right now, um, we need to find a way that uh, poorer countries, smaller countries can be able to ac access these vaccines. And often, because of the cost of the vaccines, the problems with distribution, it's not only just getting the vaccines, but also being able to distribute them and get them where they are needed. These are some of the challenges we have that confront a universal access. Uh, and I think that that is why it's important to have a global approach to this issue of getting vaccines to everyone. So we have to solve the problem of finding a vaccine that works. And now with the good news we have that uh, Pfizer and Moderna have vaccines that are so efficacious, 90%, and now AstraZeneca 
is also coming up with the vaccines that are 70 to 90 percent effective. Now we have to look at how do we uh, overcome the challenges of distribution. Barbadian Trey Cumberbatch is the 2021 Rhodes Scholar for the Commonwealth Caribbean. Governor General Dame Sandra Mason made the announcement yesterday. The 23-year-old beat out two St. Lucians, a Grenadian, a Dominican, a candidate from Antigua and Barbuda, and two from Trinidad and Tobago. Dame Sandra said all the candidates were well qualified for the scholarship. Each one of them could easily have been given the scholarship because they have vision and we know that wherever they go, as our Barbadian and Anthem says, they will do credit to our nation. This year, uh, it is my extreme pleasure to say that the scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship, has been awarded to a Barbadian, a young Barbadian, Trey Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch said he plans to pursue a master's in evidence-based social intervention and hopes to make a noticeable impact on the mental health support system in Barbados. That the minister promised some mental health policy. I very much want to be at the forefront in terms of the development of that policy and making sure that that policy meets the mental health needs of the Barbadian population. Um, I think as a society and culture, we've ignored it for far too long. And we need to have it written in policy that mental health is important and we have things in place to make sure that people have access to health care and it is um, to mental health care and it is affordable. So the policy program at Oxford would definitely help me in terms of how to formulate a social policy, how to evaluate a social policy and make sure that it utilizes the country's resources to the best of its ability. There's regional and international news after this short break. From the region now, the Bermuda Hospitals Board yesterday confirmed that six employees in a non-clinical department tested the positive for COVID-19. As we hear in this report from Bermuda Broadcasting, the entire department has been tested and quarantined as a precaution. The six were among the eight cases reported by the Ministry of Health yesterday. The Bermuda Hospitals Board said today that all six are in a non-clinical department and that contact tracing and investigations are well underway. Hospital CEO Dr. Michael Richmond said as a precaution, the entire department department has been tested and quarantined. Patient care services and visiting will continue with all the usual COVID-19 precautions that are currently in place, including wearing masks and testing of all patient admissions and elective surgery cases. Alongside the usual testing of employees, the BHB is also close to rolling out an ongoing program of staff surveillance testing using saliva and front of nose testing rather than the more invasive nasopharyngeal test. The surveillance Surveillance testing is designed to help identify asymptomatic cases early. And finally, on the international front, millions of Americans are ignoring the advice of health experts not to travel for this Thanksgiving weekend. More in this report from CBS News. On our trip to the airport, flyer frustration collides with COVID fatigue right in front of us. Two passengers arguing about wearing a mask. That's why I'm all you. This is Thanksgiving 2020. The skies over the U.S. are about as busy as last year, but passenger traffic is down nearly 60 percent. Over 4 million have passed through TSA checkpoints the most since March. AAA says up to 12 times that could decide to hit the road, despite the CDC's warning to stay home. You take those things into consideration, but at the same time, I mean, family's family, and there's nothing that's going to stop me from seeing my family. Flyers will find TSA checkpoints with added COVID protections, plexiglass barriers, officers in PPE, and new ID and bag scanners that reduce touch points. 
TSA Administrator David Pekoski. There's fewer points of contact between a passenger and an officer. Additionally, it's much better security. I mean, every, every technology we put in place provides a significant security improvement. With millions now working remotely, COVID may be changing when people choose to fly, leaving well before the holiday and staying longer. We expect to see high numbers also next Sunday. Uh, and probably tomorrow. Do you think people should be traveling? I think people should look at all the advice that's out there. And then I think passengers need to make a judgment. Uh, every person's circumstance is different. My job in TSA and my officer's job is to make sure that if you do choose to travel, we provide you as safe and as secure an experience as we possibly can. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.